All right, welcome to another evening lecture with Francis Tavern Museum. Remember, if you are joining us virtually, if you have any questions during the lecture, you can submit those to the chat or the Q&A. I know last month there were some issues with the chat, so the Q&A is always open and you can let me know about issues there. As a reminder, uh, we'll be recording this lecture, um, so it will be sent to everyone who registered if you want to share it with someone or watch it again. Yeah. Um, the views of the speaker are their own and do not represent the views of Sons of the Revolution in the State of New York, Inc. or its Francis Tavern Museum. And let me introduce tonight's speaker to you. Dr. Keith Buehler is a professor of history at Missouri Baptist University and his specialty, the United States founding era. He's a former high school teacher whose professional awards include the 2003 Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence from the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Washington University and 2009 Missouri Baptist University Distinguished Professor. He has been awarded resident research fellowships from numerous historical organizations, including the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History and the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. Tonight, he is going to be speaking about his book, George Washington's Hair, How Early Americans Remembered the Founders. Um, so I'm now going to invite Keith up to the lectern with us. All right. <laughs> Get our screen share set up so everyone can see your presentation. <laughs> and technology. <laughs> Here we go. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. I appreciate that. And it is a joy uh, and a privilege to be here at Ponce's Tavern uh, to be speaking about memory of the American Revolution in the United States at a place that early Americans themselves recognized as what they referred to as an American memory palace. And I'll be talking more about their sense of that concept tonight. But this was, in fact, the very place where in December of 1783, in the long room, George Washington took a very emotional uh, leave from his officer corps after the Peace of Paris and after the last British troops had been evacuated from New York. And so again, it's a, it's a thrill to be here. and. Francis Tavern is doubly uh, apropos for tonight's talk in that, as the title of my book is George Washington's Hair, and we will be getting into the evidence on that, that inspires that, this institution has tonight, as it has long had in its collection, a very ample example of that genre of evidence. This lock of George Washington's hair uh, that you see here tonight has been part of the collection at Francis Tavern for decades. And uh, I much appreciate uh, Sarah and the curators here uh, bringing that out for our talk tonight. The first thing that I want to mention to you is one of the stranger things that I discovered. It was not my intention to uh, learn this when I spent, as I spent 20 years re researching the memory of the revolution in the early United States. And that was that, let me fix this here. That was that the, wherever you are today in the United States, it turns out that you are never very far from a lock of George Washington's hair. And that's true, even if you just take, as I do with my map here, even if you just look at institutional holdings of putative locks of George Washington's hair. On this map, which you can see a live version of that I, may, that I maintain at georgewashingtonshair.com as a sort of uh, auxiliary to the book, um, you can navigate to the nearest institutionally held lock of George Washington's hair. Uh, this may change your family's vacations, I don't know, uh, because you can always pull it up live on your phone and just click on any of these and navigate to it. Now, I always say you should call ahead to the institution and see if they currently have it on display, if they'd be willing for you to take a look because you know those things vary uh, with different museums. But 
you know, on Manhattan, there are uh, currently several institutions, including this one, uh, that have a lock of Washington's hair. Even where I live in St. Louis, uh, we have not far from where I teach. Uh, I teach at Missouri Baptist University and, and a couple of miles away at the Missouri Historical Society, there is what is actually a fairly well provenance lock of George Washington's hair uh, in that collection. And so it goes. And there are as well collectors, private collectors in the United States, and I don't put their holdings on my map because I don't want someone robbing their homes, uh, but there are private collectors today who spend upwards of 10, 20, even as much as most recently, uh, last year, I think someone spent $45,000 buying a well-provenanced lock of George Washington's hair. Now, can I attest for all of these? Uh, no, I cannot. But the real story here, the thing that still shocks me is that by normal standards, the provenance of many of these is surprisingly good. And some of them are almost certainly the real thing. Because if you look at the Washington family correspondence, if you look at uh, the, even the incidentals in their writing, where we'll talk about holding some of this, you might say an escrow uh, during his life and after, and then parceling it out, uh, you can see that you know this happened uh, to a profound extent. And people sometimes ask about DNA, uh, whether we can match this up with DNA. And so far, this has not been done, to my knowledge, successfully with Washington's hair. That sample there, a portion of it was actually used in the 1990s uh, by the FBI in an early effort, in the early days of DNA uh, technology, they attempted uh, cooperating with this museum and several other uh, major American institutions, including Mount Vernon, for example. They tried to uh, compare some samples. At that time, they were not able to get a sequence with the technology that they had, a DNA sequence. But they did say, uh, I read the report, uh, that, that this uh, example you know, fit the pattern of other uh, incidental qualities that some of the best provenance uh, cases had. So things are looking good uh, for the sample that you have here uh, at the Tavern Museum. And uh, in the future, perhaps, in fact, maybe in the very near future, uh, it may be possible to do that. My understanding, I'm not a scientist, my understanding of the state of the art right now is that uh, unless you pull hair out from the follicle, uh, you don't get enough to get the full you don't get the information to get the entire uh, genome to see, you can't sequence the genome. But um, in 2018, I, I did an interview with the New York Times uh, for a story and I just mentioned a little bit of this. And then the next day I uh, received an email from a gentleman at USC who works in forensics. And he said that they are developing a technology that he was working on such that they think they will eventually be able to infer an entire sequence from just the shaft. Uh, the DNA, the protein that's in there. And uh, I believe that's actually been done recently with another historical figure, uh, a Native American figure and some of his hair from the 19th century. So stay tuned, uh, America, we may uh, know Washington's uh, DNA at some point. And my understanding is your museum has as well um, a, a, a bit, an actual tooth uh, from George Washington. So uh, there may be other ways of getting at this. I first began to, to, to realize that I wasn't just sort of seeing something trivial as I was finding references to Washington's hair in my larger research about memory of the American Revolution. When I was uh, working on the project at Independence Hall National Historical Park in Philly, and I was talking to one of the archivists there, and, you know, in, in any uh, such uh, work, you kind of learn to do what the people in business schools call the elevator talk, you know, where you try to explain in 60 seconds what you're doing uh, so that archivists can help you. And I, I, I did that there with an archivist at, at Independence Hall in their, in their archives uh, section in the building right there and said, you know, I'm working on the memory of the American Revolution. And, and my thesis is, because uh, I had already a lot of evidence for this, is that Americans in the early Republic in the late 18th century and going into the early 19th century had their own proprietary view of how memory itself works. That something was going on in American uh, intellectual culture. And I don't just mean high intellectual culture, although it was going on there, but that it was also happening in popular culture as well. That 
I've called in the book the physicalist term in American mnemonics, but it's a you know my way of giving it a specific name. It is that Americans were beginning to think of memory in much more material, indeed materialist terms. Much more about that tonight as we go along. And that this new view of memory, not entirely, but but, but the view that was you know the way it was tackled, the direction it was going, this materialist direction it was going, demanded physical, material uh, anchors of memory. In other words, if you're going to remember things, the, the people who increasingly believe this, which is increasingly a majority of people believe this about memory, you have to have physical um, things to, to anchor the memory. You know, we would say today relics, and indeed they use the term. And this gave sort of a scientific rationale for collecting relics. We all know that relics have been collected since time immemorial and often on religious uh, grounds. And, but now, you know, there, were, there was this other uh, reason to do this. And so I was talking about that with, with this archivist at, at Independence Hall uh, National Park. And I said, uh, the most interesting example I'm finding in early America is people doing this with Washington's hair and justifying it according to this, this new materialist view of mnemonics. And when I said that, uh, the archivist's eyes just lit up and she said, well, if you're looking for George Washington's hair, she said, First of all, we have a couple of locks here uh, in our collection, but she said the mother load is over at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, just a few blocks away. And she said There's the, there was this guy, Peter Errol Brown, uh, who in the mid 19th century collected all kinds of hair. She said he collected, you know, Washington's hair, he collected the hair of the first 15 presidents of the United States, and he collected the hair of all kinds of other. Uh, American celebrities and the hair of even animals. And she said he was doing something weird with it. He was, you know, trying to do some kind of scientific study. And she said uh, he had some kind of presidential hair book where he arranged, you know, the hair of the presidents. And she said, you should go look at that. So, you know, I got out of there and, and as fast as I could go with public transportation, uh, you can see the route here. I went a few blocks over to the Academy of Natural Sciences. And, and uh, at that time, the collection is a little bit better known now. But at that time, uh, in 2003, um, the archivist uh, that, that greeted me, you know, was was kind of surprised actually that anyone uh, wanted to see it. Uh, his name is Robert Robert Peck. He's wonderful. He actually saved this collection because uh, 40 years ago, the people at the Academy thought this is weird and we should throw it out, you know. Um, but he, he preserved it. He's the man who saved Washington's hair among other people's uh, hair, and. Uh, Robert uh, Peck, Mr. Peck showed me this and I was floored because when he showed me, for example, the presidential hair book that Peter Errol Brown in the mid 19th century put together, I was looking as I leaped through it one page at a time. I was looking, I would be looking at a, at a lithograph of each of the first 15 presidents with a lock of each president's hair. And then he showed me the correspondence that Brown kept. Brown had the receipts for this, if you know what I'm saying. He kept the copies of the correspondence he sent to the families and the incoming correspondence where they agreed to send him the hair. And because I worked on the time period, especially for the early presidents, I can recognize, you know, the handwriting of some of the people around Washington and Adams and Jefferson. And it was clearly the real deal, you know. And then I could go back later as I did it and, and, and see incidentals in their family papers. It was it was real, you know. And I was, I was absolutely amazed. And I, so I thought, well, what is he up to really? Because he had tables in his, in his papers where he invented his own little device to test the tensile strength, for example, among other attributes of human hair. And he is going to, he is going to um, look at this hair, you know, test scientifically the, the tensile strength, all these things, and try to infer if you can believe this, try to correlate the tensile strength of people's hair, you know, the weight of their hair, the moisture content, even after all these years, things like that, with their moral character. All right. And you can probably see where this is going. It, there was a lot of circular reasoning involved, but he thought it was science, uh, being a, as a member as he was of the Academy of Natural Sciences. Um, and he ended up arguing, of course, that George Washington had amazing character, that his science could now demonstrate this by looking at hair. Uh, and then he created these tables that compared Washington's hair to the hair of other, you know, American uh, celebrities, political celebrities, and uh, the story unfortunately 
takes a, a dark turn here, a sad turn. Uh, he also compared Washington's hair and the hair of other early American presidents to the hair of insane asylum inmates, to the hair of animals, uh, to the hair of, of people of various races. And that, unfortunately for Brown, was the real, uh, for him, racist payoff. He was one of the founders of what historians refer to, and of course we put this in, in air quotes because it was not actually that properly, but so-called scientific racism that uh, became you know, all too influential uh, among the American intelligentsia in the 1830s and going forward. And Brown's hair research, sadly, contributed to that. And he actually used Washington's hair to norm, you know, white people uh, for this study in an absurd way. I mean, you, you, know, you look at it and, and tear it apart if you understand how science is supposed to work, but it's, it's an incredibly sophisticated deceit. You know, as pseudoscience, it was unfortunately persuasive to people in his era. And I shudder to tell you this, but uh, I've been able to find some of that uh, cited in American a journalist into the 1930s, which really tells us something, I think, about the sad, long half-life um, of some of these things uh, in American culture, unfortunately. But when I saw that, I knew this as a point of entry, this Washington's hair, you know, this is not a fool. Uh, this is, this is a, an excellent way of getting at the memory of the American Revolution, both the use and at times the abuse uh, of of these things. Uh, I want to say just a couple things about the, again, the so-called physicalist term, uh, as I've identified it in American mnemonics. Something that was important to me in this book, in my research, was, and is, that I not simply assume that we know how memory works. I mean, maybe we do, right? Maybe our, maybe today our neurology you know, is, is the best that there will ever be, and you know, maybe our understanding is, is, is always going to be state of the art. But, but in any case, you know, as a historian, what I tend to look at is how what people think at a given time period about something influences them. And so I spent a lot of time, I spent actually before I you know, got into the hair and all that, I just spent about a year or two reading essays on memory itself in the time period, which I tend to focus in the book on 1790 to 1840, the first 50 years after the revolution and the constitutional convention. And I, because I wondered, did they think about memory in their own way, you know, compared to us in a different way, perhaps, than we do? And if they did, and it turns out they did, they had this materialist emphasis that they were aware of, uh, and that to them was new and exciting. And if they did, as they did, it turns out, did it then affect the way they went about remembering something like the American Revolution? Did it have perhaps an intended but actual political effects? Did it affect whose memories would be accredited? Because if you think memory works you know, this way and not that way, that might influence what you take to be valid memory, you know, memory that is, that is properly uh, to be accredited, to be accepted as true. In fact, uh, I found first that they had their own view, this, this physicalist view, and that it did end up having uh, unintended but significant uh, political effects. In general, it tended over time to take things in it democratizing direction. I argue in the book that it was one of the factors that leads to the democratization, so I prefer to use the plural, that, that we probably all heard of, but that historians have talked about for a long time in, so to speak, uh, the, the age of Jackson. I don't personally love the term, uh, especially in the fact that I really about that, but, but in the 1840s and in the 1830s. And to, to give you just a sense of, of how early Americans themselves thought about this, they one thing that's true of them was true of the culture was that even though they they had new ideas and put new twists on things, they liked to relate their ideas to to ancient received notions. And if you look at the at the visual that I gave you there on the left hand side of the screen, what you're seeing there is a depiction of Simonides of Seops. Uh, who was a Greek poet that Herodotus, you know, the Romans, of course, were fans of Greek culture, that Herodotus, who the founders you know, loved Greco-Roman uh, culture, and, and they and then the members of the generations that immediately followed loved to, to read Herodotus, 
that Herodotus uh, told a story about. And, and according to Herodotus, as depicted here, uh, Simonides of Cios, this Greek poet, was at a banquet one time. And, and you can see in the image, when he was at this banquet, the roof caved in and it killed all these people. And, and Simonides, fortunately for him, was one of the survivors. And then goes the story, he was able, Simonides was able afterwards, when the families wanted to try to identify the victims and bury them, Simonides was able to use sort of a mental tactic. He thought to himself, okay, well, who is sitting next to me at that dinner? And he remembered who that was. And then he thought, well, wait a minute, who was sitting next to them? And he just visually went around the room in his mind and recovered the location and thus identified the bodies and the, the grieving families were able to identify and bury their dead. From the story, um, the, the lesson that Herodotus uh, taught was that this proves the, the value of what uh, the Greco-Roman world called local memory. That in other words, in order to remember something, you have to tie memory to place, you have to locate it. Now in Herodotus's telling, and, and if the story is real, uh, in Simonides uh, telling, this could be abstract, you know, in, in, in Simonides case, it was an actual physical event that he recalled, but the people who played off of this to teach mnemonics, to te teach how you can remember things, would say, you can imagine, if you're studying for something, you can imagine a, a house, you know, or a palace, and fill it in your mind with things. In fact, this still goes on. You've probably heard some version of this at one time or another. There's a whole cottage industry and I'm in the teaching business and there are people who make their living trying to help students cram for tests, right? And sometimes you'll still hear versions of this. They'll say, oh, if you wanna you know, pass a chemistry test, uh, imagine a house and then you know, put these chemicals in this room in your mind and these in this room. And you know, I looked at some of that stuff before personally, maybe it works for other people. I'd rather just memorize things, you know. Uh, I find it to be difficult, but, but you know, to each of their own. Um, the important point for our purposes is that in the early American Republic, if you look at the, at the literature, people were beginning to believe that it can't just be an abstraction, that if you want to make this work, that mnemonics and memory palaces, that technique has to be physically real as it was in Simonides' case. If you look at this, this painting uh, to the right here, there you're seeing Raphael's uh, Renaissance era painting, The School of Athens, which depicts you know, Plato and, and, uh, and, and Aristotle's uh, school, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, um, in ancient Greece. And this is a, a detail inset from that famous painting that today is, is in the Vatican. But you have Plato pointing upward, right? Actually, like this. Uh, and you have Aristotle pointing out. And they're debating, you know, if you had philosophy classes, the theory of the forms, like basically where is reality itself? And Plato is saying, you know, he's the idealist, if you remember this stuff. He's saying reality itself isn't really in this world, it's in the mind of God, it's out there. And the world is simply. Um, more or less fulfilling God's blueprint, you know. So the ideas are are the important thing, God's plans, and this world is, you know, only more or less a shadow of that. Um, Aristotle is 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 saying, well, you know, maybe so, but all we can actually talk about is all we know is the physical world out there, and quite rightly, Aristotle thus has been credited with pushing things, pushing human thought and human epistemology, the, the question of how what we can know, making it more hands-on and practical and saying, let's look out there into the physical world. In other words, moving towards science. He's not necessarily saying Plato's completely wrong that there's no plan or there's no God, but he's saying, you know, all we can do is look out there in the physical world. And Alfred Lord Whitehead, the, the famous uh, British intellectual historian, in the early 20th century said that if you look at the history of philosophy in the Western world, it's a series of footnotes to this debate that Raphael so beautifully depicts here. It's a series of footnotes to the debate is reality abstract or is it material? And in early America on the issue of memory, their answer increasingly was it's material. 
And very self-consciously, what they were saying was, it's science. I mean, a, a really important thing to understand culturally about early America is, especially after about 1790, is that there is growing enthusiasm, I'm certainly not criticizing, uh, for science and all of the things that you can do with science, you know? I uh, think, uh, although he starts earlier than this, but think about, you know, Benjamin Franklin, this founder who is so uh, hands-on also when it comes uh, to science. And as early Americans move toward that materialist view, they're going to want to have things to physically anchor the memory of the American Revolution. Which takes us to this gentleman that you see on the left-hand side there. That is, that is Charles Wilson Peale. And this is his 1822 painting, The Artist in His Museum, depicting the first American History Museum, which was actually in the Long Gallery. And you can still go there. It's the second floor of Independence Hall, still laid out much like this, although you can't really see the cubby holes that you see there. And what Peel did there in the Long Gallery was he created the very first, again, Museum of American History, but with some catches that are very revealing of early American culture, early American memory culture at that. Because you see, Peel wasn't uh, just someone generically interested in history, nor was he, here I call him a taxidermist, um, he was that. He was a painter as well. And what he does here is he brings all of those interests together in a very suggestive way. And in this museum, he has taxidermically preserved specimens put into all of these cubby holes. And these animals that he has so carefully preserved are animals indigenous to the area that is, is becoming the United States of America. And he is making a point with this collection. He is trying to bring together natural history and American emerging political and, and civil history. And so at the top, pointedly at the top, ringing the ceiling area of the Long Gallery, this first museum, he has painted very elaborately leading figures, founders of the United States. And he is literally letting us in on the, on the secret of this taxonomy, such that as he lifts the curtain, if you, as your eye works upward, you're going from in a Linnaean classification, it's very self-consciously scientific, you're going from lesser animals, quote unquote, all the way up to homo sapiens, not just any homo sapiens, but the founding fathers of the United States, United States, and then, you know, we could have an echo track here, because he's saying basically they're superheroes. And George Washington is the ultimate action figure right up there in the corner. And you can see he has a bald eagle up there too as well. You know, This is a patriotic apologia, a patriotic defense, scientifically, Peel believes, of the United States, of American patriotism. And he's not fooling around here. Peel is aware, as American intellectuals in the period generally are, that there is a scientific critique afoot in the transatlantic world of the United States and by implication of the founders and of the future possibilities for the United States. Peel is very angry about the world's leading scientist, uh, as he's regarded at the time, a man by the name of Buffon in France, who is his, Buffon's claim to fame, essentially, as a naturalist, um, is that he says that America has an inferior physical environment. I mean, everything's wrong, the air pressure, the weather, you know, everything. And that as a result of this inferior physical environment, according to Buffon, there's no hope for this emerging United States. Biologically, because of the inferior environment, America, according to Buffon, will always produce diminutives, inferior biological specimens. And Peel here is saying, no, we have thriving living creatures in the United States, moving all the way up the taxonomy, and the founders themselves, you know, are thriving examples of human greatness. And then if you look at the bottom there, you can see these, you can see these uh, 
you know, large specimens. And you can see here on the other side of the curtain, you, you see a, a very large uh, creature, a skeleton. This is a mastodon. <laughs> and Peel has uncovered actually, and, and brought to his museum, um, a, a mastodon, this, this, you know, ancient, huge creature in North America. And he's beginning to prepare that for inclusion. And the message he's sending is, no, this environment produces, you know, profound creatures of massive size. He's not the only person by any means who's worried about this. Again, you know, a lot of the American elite is. Thomas Jefferson was so upset about Buffon on this score that he shipped an entire moose to France to, to literally say, in your face, you know? At one point, uh, Ben Franklin was dining uh, with Buffon, uh, you know, when he was in Paris, and Buffon started running his mouth about all this stuff. And Franklin said, stand up. And Buffon, you know, didn't know what was about to happen. Buffon stood up and then Franklin stood up and Franklin was a lot taller than Buffon. And he said, essentially, who's the diminutive, you know? Like, who's the tiny guy here? I mean, how, how does this work, you know? Um, but they were, they were really worked up about this. This, by the way, the other uh, image that you see, there's another view of Peel's museum. And then you see, of course, the lock of Washington's hair, right? Uh, with, with a little uh, portrait that uh, Peel made, a little miniature. This was commissioned by Martha Washington herself. Uh, by, you know, she had Charles Wilson Peel make this for the very purpose that you see there of putting a lock of Washington's hair in it uh, so that she could treasure that. So Peel himself got involved in this whole uh, type of enterprise. But there's more of a larger connection here. Peel um, became interested in the 18 teens in the idea of physiognomy, which can be traced to a Swiss clergyman, Johann Kasper Lavater, who in the 18th century began to teach, uh, he really basically quit worrying about theology and taught science as he imagined it, at least instead. Uh, he began teaching uh, this idea that he called physiognomy, the essence of which was that by synecdoche, you know, reasoning from, from parts to holes, that you could look at little bits of a person's body and reason their moral character from it. And he developed his own rules about how you can do this. And one of those characteristics was human hair. In fact, Lavater in his manual on physiognomy said, from the hair alone, we may know the man. And Peel was into that. You know, and so when he made these paintings, which were probably the most critically acclaimed, you know, paintings of their day, they were of the of the framers of the United States. One of the things he was proud of was that he captured the hair. And by the way, a uh, little tidbit: George Washington refused to wear a wig. He didn't have to; he had great hair. Uh, he powdered it every day. Uh, but Peel uh, and his son uh, Rembrandt, who kind of took over the family business of chronicling the founders uh, when his dad died in the uh, early 1820s, um, they were proud of the fact, he and his son Rembrandt, that they saw Washington's hair before he powdered it uh, when they were doing studies of his form basically for their paintings because they got the hair right. And with all this Lavatarian stuff, they really believed that would help scientists in the future to prove scientifically that it wasn't just a matter of opinion that Washington was all that, that he and, and the founders were, were that great. Um, and then you see this phrenological analysis because while Peel died in 1824 before phrenology uh, really came onto the scene, it enters the United States in the 1830s. You may know about, about this, it's better known uh, today. But this was a, a fad uh, that spread from Europe to the United States, the, the disciples of which believed that scientifically you could analyze people's character by looking at the protuberances on their skull and you could map a person's skull and that because qualities in the human brain and qualities that people have like their different aspects of intelligence and even morality according to the phrenologists um, have different organs in the brain that are localized within the brain and and they said that that if you have a quality in spades like if you're really strong in something like courage that you're going to have a correspondingly large organ of courage in your brain it's going to be a large lump but therefore you can just map you know skulls and make inferences about people's qualities they label people's skulls as you can see there 
This is actually an actual reading of Charles Wilson Peale's grandson by the same name, Charles Wilson Peale uh, II. And they, they started doing this at Peale's Museum after he died. Uh, Rembrandt, his, his son, again, takes over the effort to understand the founders with science, uh, was really into this. And here's an interesting detail about this. One of the qualities that the phrenologists thought they could show, one of the organs they discovered in the human brain is an organ of locality, which was the organ, they said, that ties to that materialist view of memory. In other words, that you have to have a local, a located physical um, anchor for memory. So that becomes again, a, a proof that the human brain, according to them, is wired to require relics. And it, it doesn't even have to be religious anymore. So you, you can, they can justify collecting you know, locks of washing his hair, and they don't, even though most of the most Americans at the time, so the United 1840, not all, but many are Protestants and they and they pride themselves in being Protestant and therefore um, so my, my take with theirs, uh, many of them saw themselves as sort of militantly anti-Catholic and they and they would be against you know what they saw as as a Catholic interest in reliquary. Uh, they would do a similar thing now with with uh, political relics, you can use the term relics, but they would say, well, we're not venerating them in the uh, religious sense, we're scientifically anchoring memory uh, because of the requirements of locality. Peel represented this a conservative view of memory. Uh, when he had that museum that I showed you a moment ago at Independence Hall, it's actually quite apropos that the people who wrote the Constitution came and saw Peel's museum they, when they would take breaks sometimes in working on the Constitution. Now, I'm a fan of the Constitution in so many ways, as, as many of us are. Um, but I do think it's true to say, even though many of the same people are involved in writing the Constitution as were involved in approving the Declaration of Independence. And of course, uh, some of the drama happens in the same building, right? Uh, Independence Hall in 1776 and then 1787. Uh, most historians would say, and I would, I would certainly agree, that there is a certain amount of, of movement for, for reasons, uh, not necessarily foolish reasons, but there's a movement from 1787, uh, I'm sorry, from 1776, where in the Declaration of Independence, the generation is throwing off government power, using natural law you know, to rebel, to 1787, where they say, well, wait a minute, we don't want to get completely crazy about this. Um, and some people are, Shays' Rebellion in 1784. You know, some people think now we're going to have antinomianism, where we're not going to have any laws. And so they come back literally to the same place and in the Constitution say, we're going to tighten things up a little bit now. Uh, in other words, the Constitution is kind of counter-revolutionary. It is, in a certain way, conservative. And Peel is sending a message in his museum that the founders are not just average folks, they are this elite and they know what they're doing. And he brings average Americans, he sets the, the prices really low at the museum, he brings them in and he, he writes in his notes, he wants them to see the elites up there, founding fathers and stuff, and be awed by this. And he wants them to literally put themselves in their place and be humble and accept the new constitution and no more revolutions. That conservative view prevails for a while. You see the same thing in the 1790s with the beginning of the state historical society movement, starting first um, in Massachusetts with the first uh, great state historical society in the United States. And this guy, Jeremy Beltman, he is uh, very concerned uh, with Shays Rebellion and, and with what he sees as you know, too much democratization in American culture. And he says, we have to get a handle on the memory of the past and, and formalize it and make sure the great men are respected and we don't have just a sort of people's republic gone crazy, you know? So he starts um, trying to tighten the reins. And then you get uh, people like this guy uh, in Philadelphia who is going to uh, be uh, one of the, the people who's involved uh, there with collecting a lock of Washington's hair and starting John Fanning Watson, uh, a, a, the Philadelphia, or I'm sorry, the Pennsylvania Historical Society, and he becomes a corresponding member of a bunch of these. You can see his little memory box where everything's in its place here. He promotes, again, this elitist view where they try to get things under control. To me, the high water mark of that is 1831, wherein um, we're in Virginia, they start the Virginia Historical Society, and that's the year where you get the you know, rebellion in Virginia that 
that, that scares uh, the, the slaveholding elite where Nat Turner picks July 4th. He has to change the date for logistical reasons, but pointedly on July 4th, he wants to lead a slave rebellion uh, and overthrow the slaveocracy in Virginia. And you know, the thing falls apart, but uh, Virginia says the elites, you know, George Tucker and others, we got to get a handle on the, on the memory of the revolution. So they start the State Historical Society. By the way, I love these societies. They've saved a lot of valuable things uh, for historians. But the original roots of these things, as they themselves will tell you today, tended to be very conservative. Things start to change that, which is really the theme of my book, in, in relatively short order. In the 1820s and 30s, and I think they changed largely for reasons demographic. And an analogy I would draw is to when I was a little kid in the 1970s and 80s, um, like a lot of little boys, I guess, growing up and certainly history minded ones, I would read everything I get my hands on about World War II. But now I look back at a lot of the books I read when I was a kid. And what I notice is in those books, one gets the impression that World War II was fought, you know, of, by, and for the great generals. I mean, it was as if in those books, it was just as if the troops of the line barely existed. You know, there were just millions of people in the aggregate who the, the great generals moved around like chess pieces, you know? And it wasn't until I got to graduate school in the 1990s that you started to get things like uh, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, in pop culture, at least. And, and you got things like HBO's The Band of Brothers, where all of a sudden people were interested in average soldier stories. And why were we interested culturally? Because so many World War II veterans were dying and the officers had tended to be, of course, fewer in number. So uh, in general, there were always less of them, but they also tended to be older. And by the 1990s, there were very few officers of any rank left to tell us about World War II. So all of a sudden, when we wanted to hear from someone, we talked to privates, you know? Something very similar happens by the 1820s and 30s when it comes to the memory of the American Revolution. So that if you look at census records, the 1840 census is the best example. They actually ask people, did you serve in the revolution? And if you take things down to the sort of face-to-face -face community level, by that time, if you look at the people who are alive, it's almost exclusively privates, even drummer boys, from the American Revolution. And as George Bancroft, a living historian at the time, said, all of a sudden, these guys who nobody cared about in terms of their role in the revolution, because they were a dime a dozen, you know, these low-ranking guys, all of a sudden now they're icons of the revolution. And they actually were confused by it. You know? As Bancroft said, they all of a sudden get pulled out, you know, obscurity and carted to Fourth of July celebrations until he said their bones were ready to fall out. Uh, and people want to know what they saw, you know, at, at the revolution. And so you go from this is one of Rembrandt's paintings of George Washington, from, from his patrie et pater, you know, from his um, patriotic father, you know, painting of George Washington, to this. This is uh, E.B. Hilliard in 1862, during the beginning of the Civil War, puts out a book of literally the last known survivors of the American Revolution, the last people getting a pension. And he puts out these photographs of them because you actually have the technology then. And one of them is this guy, Daniel Waldo, who's just a private, you know, and Waldo dies. They're all so old that frankly, several of them die as they're going to publication. And he writes in the script, he, you know, because everybody wants to know where are they going to go see these living relics? They call them, you know, the revolution that physically instantiate the thing. And he, uh, Waldo, uh, Daniel Waldo, you know, he says basically, well, you know, if people want to ask where is Waldo, which has a whole different resonance today, uh, he says he's dead, but there's a lock of his hair that's been preserved. And that shows you the drift in, a, in I think, an exciting way where all of a sudden now average people matter. Lots of people are going to step onto the stage now and in the 1820s and 30s when the old guard is literally dying or dead when the officers are gone, when Washington and friends, the elite are, you know, officers are gone, and when average people's stories are now being heard for the first time in a, in a privileged sort of fashion. And it creates an opening for new tellings of the American Revolution, including for women. This woman, Emma Willard, is a hero of mine. She was a master teacher. I mean, just unbelievable. And I've read all of her textbooks. She wrote textbooks in the 1820s and 30s on American history, and they were really well done. And her students revered her. And I just want to say, I've been in the teaching business for 30 years. My students are very kind to me. 
But I, I worry every time I look at this, because in the 1890s, you can see what her students did here after she died. They made a statue of her, all right? And it's still there, you know, in, in New York and uh, in Troy, New York. And I just don't see that happening uh, anytime soon for me. But it was actually pointed that they made a statue because she believed in that material view of memory, that you have to anchor memory material. She taught that to them. And she taught them when Lafayette visited the United States in 1823 and 24 and took this memory to her. She made her students, or she got Lafayette to come to her school in Troy, New York. She, she made sure they shook his hand. She made sure they took souvenirs, you know, got his autograph. And she taught them to get little artifacts from their living relatives. Because again, the material stuff mattered. And she even wrote about locks of Washington's hair you know, in her textbook. One of her students took the message to heart, and this is a lock of George's hair um, here and Martha Washington's hair above that you can find uh, in a museum in Chicago that one of her students kept in a scrapbook that still exists. And this is an illustration in uh, one of Emma Willard's books that shows that memory palace idea, you know, where she's so focused on that. This is uh, my favorite person, maybe in American history. Just the other day, one of my students offhandedly said, if you could talk to anybody in American history, who would it be? You know, they're expecting Washington or Lincoln. But I got a lot of debt on those people. And if I only get one pick, I want to meet this guy. The best image I have of him is this one right here, where he's sitting in this rocking chair that he drew himself. And he drew it on a remittance for a pension check that he was owed because he was a pensioner from the American Revolution. And he was part of this wave of new attention to average people. He was a drummer boy. You, we might say just a drummer boy in the American Revolution. And he was African-American, which is actually an important part of the story. He was one of the, we don't have exact numbers, but between four to 6,000 African-Americans who served on the Patriot side in the Revolution. And after the Revolution, he went through all of the cultural, social challenges that, that African-Americans did. He lived in Middletown, Connecticut, and he, he lived to see a great deal of cultural, unfortunately, retrenchment in American life, involving things like the rise of scientific racism and the, the harsh attitudes that, that, that were underwritten by it in American culture, including right there where he lived in Middletown, Connecticut. You see that frontispiece of a book there. That is a published address while he was living there in Middletown, Connecticut, it was published by Wilbur Fisk, who was the president of a university. And I pointed to where, it took me years to find it, but I'm convinced I found exactly where it is. And I can show you on street view um, where it is, where it was. But Ockwitz Cottage was this exact spot here. And just a few hundred feet away was first a, a military institute for boys. This guy, Captain Partridge ran this place. And then he sold the campus to what became Wesleyan University, one of the first you know, Christian colleges in the United States today. And even that, it was a good school in many ways. Today, a wonderful uh, elite school, in fact. But Wilbur Fisk was their first president. And Fisk wrote this treatise, really, gave a speech and then published it for colonization, for, and this is a terrible thing to say, but it's just the truth. Um, he was part of this movement to deport African Americans to Africa. To, and, and this fellow Hamid Ahmed, who served in the American Revolution, wasn't going anywhere. You know, he knew that he had the bona fides, uh, not only to live in the United States, but to be revered uh, properly as an American hero. He says in his pension application, I discharge blood from a wound suffered at the Battle of Germantown. And he was very proud of his service for the Patriot cause. And this lock of hair that you see here is a lock of hair that he said that Washington's heirs had at some point given to him. And he claimed that after the war, at some point, he had been a, a servant was his term, but one would assume it must have been uh, enslaved, um, a servant of George Washington. That specific claim, I can't verify. I've talked many times to Mary Thompson, who's recently retired as the in-house historian at Mount Vernon. Um, she, she can't find evidence of it. She's, she's worked on it a lot. Although Mary's very sophisticated, she can tell you there are scenarios where maybe in some situations, uh, maybe he did some temporary stuff uh, for Washington. 
But so I, I don't know, you know if he was in any sense uh, employed by Washington in such a way. But uh, I will tell you, I was able to find in a late breaking way, so that I didn't even include it in the book, um, at that military academy that later becomes the grounds for Wesleyan University, um, there were boys who took up a, a, a subscription to give money to Hamad Akhmet when his wife died. And one of those boys was a lineal heir of Washington's adopted children. And his, that boy's dad, I was able to find, had locks of Washington's hair that he had received. And it is strangely plausible that that boy would have given you know, the hair. Um, so I don't know. Um, but it's just remarkable. He, Hamid Ahmed made his way in the world saying, I have this connection to Washington and I and other African-Americans are patriots. And it's just really, I think, a beautiful touching story about, about the truth um, of the American Revolution, how people like him were able to increasingly make that truth. Ahmed gave another parcel of that, which I also discovered still exists. And that's a wild story, how he hunted it down. Um, but he gave a, a bit of that hair uh, to a, a, a student at Wesleyan University when the university changed. And thus he got caught up in, in the issue of, of religion. Wesleyan University was Methodist. And, and Wilbur Fisk, that guy, should you got mad because he said, you know, you shouldn't be giving away Washington's hair. It's too precious of a relic. Funny thing is, um, Wilbur Fisk, when he went to Europe, wrote a whole thing about how Catholics have relics and we shouldn't be doing that kind of thing, you know. Um, and yet, you know, he was fine with relics of Washington, in fact, protected uh, of them. But it's very revealing. I talk a lot in the book about uh, something that I think still haunts us, but it's it's the rise of, um, I think, mistaken. I say this as someone who teaches at an evangelical university, as someone who myself, and to borrow C.S. Lewis's phrase, I'm a convinced evangelical when it comes to historical uh, Christianity, to what Lewis called mere Christianity, you know, back uh, at the time of Christ. But there is a genealogy that I talk about in the book where in the 1820s and 30s, I think mistakenly, and I think sincerely, but a lot of evangelicals in that period after the Great Awakening became convinced uh, falsely that, that the founding fathers in the main believed what they believed. And the evidence is they did. You know, I mean, uh, Jefferson said that the um, resurrection was the delirium of crazy imaginations. Uh, Adams, you know, said that he couldn't believe that God would come to earth to be spit upon by people uh, that he didn't believe in the incarnation. But that democratization thing sort of cut in the evangelicals direction unintentionally. This guy, John Gray, was a, an evangelical celebrity in the 19th century. And he and other evangelical privates who converted after the war they were dem demographically the kinds of people who became evangelicals. People read their story backwards. They looked at these godly evangelical privates in their midst and said, this guy was in the revolution and he's an evangelical. I bet all the people in the revolution were evangelicals. Washington must have been. They said it over and over again. And it created a mythology that continued. This lastly, you see here, this um, newspaper story is in, in the Catholic Telegraph in 1835. And they call the evangelicals out and say, this is unbelievable. You hate relics, but you love locks of Washington's hair. Um, and at this point, I'll, I would love to take, uh, depending on talk about the book, I'll skip it now. Uh, stay in touch with me if you would. You can go to georgewashingtonshair.com. I'd like to take a couple questions, if we may. Thank you so much. Okay. Could you give us a description? Could you give us a description of how the hair was obtained was any of it obtained during life? Yes. Like when someone got a haircut? Yes. Were people deliberately saving it? Was some of it obtained after death? Sure. So most of it was certainly obtained during his lifetime. Uh, one of his barbers, a guy whose last name was Pierre uh, in Philadelphia, kind of took pride in uh, the fact that he collected a lot of it when he gave Washington his haircuts. It's not necessarily clear that Washington even knew he was keeping all this afterwards. Um, but he was the source of a lot of this kind of stuff. Washington's own family did keep some of it back, as Washington did too. And again, that was more common in the 18th century. To some extent, people would give out locks of their hair a little bit like uh, we used to give out school pictures you know, in the 1970s, 80s. Today, I guess it would be selfies. 
uh, as sort of a signature item. Washington's case, things just went bigger uh, as they so often did with Washington and, and any, seemingly anyone others, anyone else's case. There are alleged instances of Washington's hair taken when he was reinterred in 1831, uh, but we argue about whether those are the real thing. Uh, people did. Uh, one account said that there was no hair uh, when they took his body out and reinterred it, and uh, later some people claimed that there was and that they took some of it. When he died, uh, it, Tobias Lear, his secretary, recorded in his diary, quote unquote, I cut some of his hair. How much? I don't know. So, yeah, that's what I can say. Go ahead. Our, uh, our piece of Washington's hair is reddish brown. Yes. Uh, for how long did he have reddish brown hair? You know, I would probably defer to somebody like Mary Thompson, uh, who, who really knows these things. Uh, you know, now just retired historian from Mount Vernon. My, my sense of it, I've never actually, it's a big question, but I've never worked out the chronology. It seems to me that he, that he kept his natural color it's hard for me to know because he powdered it all the time, you know, pretty early in his life. And it ends up that way in most of the paintings. But my sense of like people who saw him without the powder is that he kept it a long time, that he didn't, didn't gray very aggressively. Um, but I couldn't give you a year or anything like that. Yeah. I think I started graying earlier in life than he did. We have uh, one question from folks online. Um, by what process is the hair authenticated? Sure. So again, the DNA hasn't really so far been used with much success, although we'll probably get there very soon. You know, if people are willing, well, you might have to destroy some to get there, which is one of the complications. But generally, it's the best we can do today is to use standard provenance stuff. In other words, you look at letters, you know, things like that. Um, and you look at, you know, do we have letters where the Washington family says, I gave some of this to someone? And then do we have a custody over time that's well attested in in letters it's not it's not perfect you know one of the best attested examples would be the in in uh, massachusetts the masons of massachusetts have a lock of washington's hair that is in a an urn that paul revere himself purpose built when washington died for that and they got it directly from martha i mean it's well attested in, in, the, in the evidence from the time uh, in the book, I, I do this whole section in, in the afterword on cameo appearances of Washington's hair through history. And it's like that little game people play on the internet where they connect the actors six degrees of Kevin Bacon or something. I, I play it with my students. I can connect almost any major American historical event to, to Washington's hair. You know, like Robert E. Lee had, Robert e. Lee had a lock of Washington's hair because he married into the Custis family. Abraham Lincoln at one point gave a lock of his hair to someone who put it in with, with you know, a ring with Washington's hair. Um, Ulysses S. Grant held that urn at one point in a ceremony with Washington's hair. So, you know, there you got the major players in the Civil War. Uh, I could go on and on, strangely. Uh, it's always there. The hair is there. <laughs> go ahead. So, okay. You said something about uh, no belief in the resurrection, but isn't he asking for his body to stay out for three days and three yes. night? just in case he's raised from the dead, he doesn't want to get found stuff in the ground. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mary Mary Thompson actually has the best book, I would say, on, uh, on Washington's religious beliefs, uh, but there are dueling schools of thoughts. Fundamentally, we're not sure what he meant by that remark. Uh, one idea is that he was afraid uh, that maybe he wasn't going to be completely dead, because, right. you know, they didn't always get that right, and there were stories and actual instances where people were resuscitated in the grave. We don't know. But he, he always dodged any theological question. He but, did. But the book Sacred Fire has hundreds and hundreds of biblical quotes from almost every book. Yes, I, I have around. I have read that one. Yes. And it's got a whole table of everything. I, I have like read. wanted to hang people on the higher hill than Haman for stealing from the army. And he talks about Moses' hygiene in 1775. Oh, yeah, he was super literary in scripture. He had tremendous range. In fact, 50 times the big trick. Right. You know, where each man dwells in Israel under in peace. That's right. So it seems to me that he had a lot of hope for the resurrection yeah. because people hoped that their hair would be enough for resurrection, even. Yeah, Mary, Mary Thompson does a beautiful job. Uh, well, you did a beautiful yeah. job tonight. Well, I appreciate I that. You. Thank you. Very special. Thank you. We used to do hair tests as doctors all the time oh. for lead, mercury. That's how they claimed that Napoleon yes. was another, and Lincoln was actually at yes. in his hair. 
that's been done with Washington at UVA a few years ago. And anything? well, what they found is the bullet point I remember is that he had a, an excellent diet. They said he had a centrist diet, well balanced. Of course he did, right? Washington always wins. Uh, <laughs> thank you all so much. Thank you so much for that uh, that wonderful talk. His book, uh, George Washington's Hair, How Early Americans Remember the Founders, is available now. If you're here in front of me, you can even grab a copy from me once we're done. Um, thank you to those of you joining us online. Thank you for being with us as always. Um, and thank you to those of you who have donated. You are helping to keep the mission of Francis Tavern Museum alive to share the uh, history of the American Revolutionary War with the public. If you are interested, you can join our mailing list on our website, francistavernmuseum.org, and stay up to date with all of our events. Our next lecture is going to be on November 10th, and again, it will be in person and online. Um, so that's about it. Thank you all for joining us for another wonderful lecture. Thank you.